Jean, do you think that it's important to be selective in choosing a DJ for your wedding? Oh, definitely. I, I mean, I, I feel like a DJ organizes your entire party from start to finish. It's, it's all about the energy. I think that they bring that energy to the table. Uh, somebody that's just not seasoned uh, in the industry, I, I think that really that could, that could compromise the entire event completely. Welcome to our podcast. So you're engaged. Now what? Today's episode, we are so lucky to have. Um, we're very excited because we have a new member of our team, Jamie Valeri. He has been a longtime DJ in the area. Um, uh, he has a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience. Just to give you a little insight and background about, um, you know, our acquiring, we've acquired you, Jamie. <laughs> uh, we we did a hunt for a full year looking for the right DJ team. Our CEO went out wedding after wedding. Uh, he looked at the professionalism. He looked at the setup. He looked at, uh, you know, little details of things, what things looked like once it was all set up, um, the, you know, watching the crowd, watching their experience. And he had a huge list of criteria of somebody that he was listening to, looking for. And then he would follow it up and go watch them again to make sure that there was consistency in it. And he found you, Jamie. Jamie. Um, so we're really lucky because you have brought your years and years of experience to our team, and uh, we're going to talk about that. Hi, Jamie. Hello, hello. Nice to be here. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Jamie, how long have you been doing this? It's uh, about 30 years. 30 years. I'm sure the industry has changed quite a bit, or is it is it pretty standard? I feel like it changes every day. It does. Most is that definitely. because music is always changing or couples' interests are changing? I think uh, couples, um, obviously for me, are getting a little bit younger. So, you know, when I meet people, I'm meeting <laughs> a, a different generation at, these, at this point. Um, so I have to stay in tune to the trends, you know, what everybody likes and what everybody's, you know, expecting, you know, for their wedding. Where do you get that information? Do you get it just by listening? A lot, or? Of, lot of listening, yeah. A lot of listening to the customer, making sure that, you know, we accommodate everybody's needs based on what they want. And if you hear two, three, four, 10 people say the same thing. You understand that it's trending, obviously. So you kind of just listen to your customers. We were just talking a minute ago about should you be selective when choosing a DJ? And why would somebody choose perhaps you uh, over another DJ or another company? And this is not like a, any sort of a sales pitch, but just, you know, to prepare somebody who's out there looking for a DJ for their wedding, you know, why you? So uh, it's actually probably one of the most difficult questions to answer because there are a DJ, you know, just about on every corner. Um, you find them in bars, you find them in nightclubs, you find them on the radio. Um, DJs can do a multitude of things under that title, but it doesn't mean that we can do your wedding. Um, a wedding DJ is what you're looking for. And when you're selecting a wedding DJ, it's really good to understand their experience, that they've done this before. They have, you know, um, a good understanding of your expectations before the wedding starts. So, you know, I tend to try to really get to know my customers, sit down with them, talk to them on the phone several times, kind of understand who they are, who their families are, who their backgrounds are. The more I know about the customer and their situation, I can work better for them. So I always say that, you know, if we have a, a good rapport, good communication, open channel communication on top of that, Tons of experience. You know, again, I have 30 years experience. Anybody that, you know, works around me is similar, 20, 15 years. You know, no one really is a a, a newbie in this, you know, the, the people that are around me. So we surround myself with, you know, all the best, you know, talent that makes sure that when we, we do someone's wedding that we're in tune. You can and, trust your team. And we can trust everybody that's involved. So jumping off a little bit of a, like the whole... Uh, idea of communication. What mm -hmm. kind of questions do you actually ask these couples so that you could really learn a little bit more about them and give sure. them a specific experience geared to to what they want? Yeah, hundred percent. Great, great question. Um, so usually, like right close to the wedding date, I would get together with the bride and groom, and I would ask them specifically, a the obvious, what what are your family backgrounds, culture. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, culture is important. Do you have you know a, a background that you know requires certain music styles? You know, is uh, the client Spanish, Portuguese, Asian? We, we, everybody in, in America, you know, comes here, you know, from different places. So we need to accommodate everyone. So and you do accommodate important. everybody. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of like, you don't have a specific type of culture that you're known for. You work all across the board. I, I would call it a wedding culture. You know, it really is. Okay. We, we work weddings every single weekend in and out. 
Um, do a lot of our DJs have other experiences? Sure. But on the weekends, you know, we're working weddings together. So it's, it's a cross between knowing their culture, knowing their interests, but also knowing their music style. Music style, but more even importantly, is the personality of the customer. Because the personality leads us to engage their personality. And what do I mean by that? As an MC, how am I, how, how are you, how, how can I make you happy by approaching your dance floor and not approaching it? I need to find that fine line where there's a cutoff. I don't want to be doing head spins on your dance floor and everybody around me is on the center of attention, not the bride anymore. So I need to know, and I'm never doing a head spin, by the way, <laughs> but I need to make sure that people understand this, you know, that there's a level of, you know, of um, understanding, you know, what you want. You know, and how you want us to engage you. You know, you can go back to the days where bands were popular at weddings and some still people do book bands. There's an interaction. There's a, a feel that there's a live person playing the music. And that's what people really appreciate about a band. They appreciate the interaction. You can get that from a DJ. Just how much. And with um, the proper experience. And so you, you like reading the crowd, building the night. Reading really the, taking it to a different different places energy wise. Yeah, I mean reading the crowd and under, and like I said understanding the personality of the bride. You know, if the bride says to me, "Jamie, you know, listen, we want someone really interactive hyping the crowd out in the middle on the dance floor." I need to be that person. If she said, "Listen, we just want someone to make announcements and get through the formalities." I need to take a step back and be that person. The music is always going to be great music. You know, our job is to make people dance. So the DJ's reading that crowd and making sure that the uh, the music is what the crowd wants. And then we take the ideas from our customers, the bride and groom, and we infuse those with our ideas to make sure that everybody's enjoying themselves. And that's live. It's not done in, in, in preparation. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I would imagine that that's a hard thing to determine in a consultation with the couple. I feel like when you're, it's the day of the party is, is when you're really reading that energy. And 100%. that's where your experience would have to come in. I agree. I agree. So we get a lot of input in, in advance, mm -hmm. but I tell our customers, I'm not preparing sets. I'm not prepping your music. To the point of, you know, I'm playing this song after this song after this song because that's a jukebox. Anybody can can put a jukebox in a room or, or run a playlist. You know, we have to read the crowd and, and inject the songs that you chose at the right time. So then I guess your questions as far I, – I mean because I know that when I got married, I had a DJ as well. And I, I, I went into that meeting thinking how, this is going to be very specific. Here's a, a – for example, I mean, a list of 30 songs, you know, um, I did give him a few songs. I said, please somewhere, somehow get these in. Um, but yeah, generally I, I do remember him saying, you know, just what type of music do you, do you like? And that was kind of really what he asked me. And then he kind of took over from there. Right. So when it comes to music, yeah, it can be as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, a lot of our customers come to us and go, I don't really know what music, okay. you know, I really have mm -hmm. to trust you. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you know, gaining the, cu the customer's trust is important. I want them to trust me so that I can, I can properly make sure that their party is the best party they're ever going to have. Um, so reading the crowd is the most important seeing the age groups. I mean, I'll walk through the cocktail hour sometimes just to see who I'm going to be working with the rest of the night. Okay. You know, just by looks and, and feel in the room, the energy in the room, are people loud? Are they quiet? Are they drinking? Are they not drinking? Like, what are they doing in terms of cocktail hour? And once I gauge who my audience is, you know, I get a, I get the blindfold taken off in a sense and I can walk into the reception and start that first set with exactly what they're looking for, meaning not the client, but their guests, you know, what are the guests looking for? So I can come right out in the very first set and be successful. And if that party's successful at the first song, it's going to be even more successful the last song. Is a DJ separate from an MC? Is, is it always separated where you're hosting and you're somebody separate of the MC is selecting the music and putting the sets together. Could you go into that a little bit more? Sure. Yeah. So definitely two people. Um, MC is really the person that's going to coordinate the outline of the day. So when is the, you know, when is the first dance happening? When is your introduction happening? Working with the maitre d' to make sure that that goes off on the right timing. Um, interfacing with the the venue as well as the dance floor. So it's, it's kind of like that mediator in, in between of everybody. Um, the DJ is really the person playing the music, um, looking at your requests, looking at your crowd, looking at your audience and supporting the MC. Um, we do work together as a team. Um, so a lot of us prefer who we work with. So we're always in the same team situation a lot. Um, cause that makes us comfortable and we can kind of read each other's minds knowing, you know, when I say I want to do something like this or this type of set or this type of music, my DJ knows what I'm, I'm looking for. What are some questions that you would suggest to clients to ask a DJ if they're if they're on the hunt to find the right DJ? What are some key questions that are important? So the most, in, in my mind, the most important questions if I was shopping for a DJ is going back to what we said already, the experience side. You know, make sure DJ has experience. Make sure they're willing to meet with you, talk to you, get to know you. 
um, make sure that they're working in the wedding industry. You know, if a, if a, a wedding DJ says, yeah, I'll meet you on a Saturday at five o'clock, there's a good chance they're not that, that actively busy, you know? <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, you want to find someone that actually can, can talk, you know, talk the talk and, and walk the walk at the same time. So it, it's important to, uh, you know, to find a DJ that's actually working in the industry. Don't don't hire someone from radio. Don't hire someone from a bar because you know you like the song they played that night. You were out with your friends. Um, so shopping for the right the right DJ. Um, but once you're there and you're actually sitting in front of them, what what questions should you ask? I mean, a lot of it really comes down to what they offer and what your expectations are. So it's a lot about the extras, a lot about the items that you want to have. So explaining what your your expectation of the entire reception really is. You know, are you, are you into the exotic? Are you into the extras? Are you not into them? You know, finding, finding out what the DJ offers because they might offer more than you think, you know, they, some, I mean, they, they, they just might offer more. Okay. So it's, it's good to find out that they're a company, they have support, they have more going on than just, Hey, we play great music. So you're the entertainment of the night. You're setting the entire mood, the ambiance, the, the feeling of the night. You're in control really of how good of a time people are having, how reserved it is, how much of a party it turns into. You have a lot of that in your lab. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's something I tell just about everybody. If the DJ is not good at the wedding, no one's remembering your food. They're not remembering anything else. They're just going to be talking negatively about the entire mm -hmm. reception. Mm -hmm. So your DJ is going to make or break your party. Mm -hmm. Um, so you talked about the extras yeah. and, uh, you know, when, when we speak to our clients here, you know, I, I sometimes feel like they, they, they don't even know what, what that means, what they want. And I, I often go, oh, you know, we're, like what you just said, we're looking for simple, we're looking for extras over the top. Um, is there any sort of, uh, minus the, a DJ and an MC, would you say that there's a few must haves in your opinion that you would say, let's, let's at least go for this. So there's, there are some standards, okay. um, when it comes to what a DJ supplies, and, mm -hmm. and I would say that almost every, almost every party needs atmosphere. So I always try to talk about atmosphere first, meaning, you know, what atmosphere does your party have? Is it a daytime wedding with windows? Are we at a nighttime event and it's black tie? You know, what's, what's the overall atmosphere? What will be, how are we going to accommodate that? Because a lot of times some of our extras do add to the atmosphere. For instance, lighting. I've been in a lot of venues that are beautiful during the day and you walk in at night and it's set for a tone of dining. You know, you want to go out to a romantic dinner. It's, that's great. You know, it's Valentine's Day. You're in a restaurant. But now you have to turn the dance floor on. And the dance floor in a dining room are definitely different. Does it need to be a nightclub? Absolutely not. But we can still give it some atmosphere. So lighting plays a big role in atmosphere. And there's two different kinds of lighting. There's dance floor lighting. And then there's decor lighting. So we can decor and, and uplight your room to give you decor lighting, uh, which is basically lights around the room, you know, lighting the walls and perimeter. Or dance floor lighting, which is actually giving you motion, pattern, and color to your dance floor, which kind of encourages people to get up and dance a little bit sometimes. And it even helps fill the dance floor with some motion, which right. is important. Yeah. Do you use that the entire reception or does is that something that, that builds with the night? How does that work? Yeah, it's a good question. I get that a lot, actually. Um, the lighting needs to be appropriate. So if it's dance floor lighting driven and we're playing something from, I don't know, this 1960s, yeah, it's going to be minimal. You know, we want to control that. We want to make it minimal. When we're doing something from today, you know, it's the exact opposite. It's over the top. So you want to you want to do it progressively and do it based on the music that you're actually playing and the sets that are, you know, um, in front of you with the DJ. The, the lighting is also uh, controllable. So it's intelligent. It's, it's run from a computer. So there's an operator standing there operating the lighting. So it's not just, you know, turn them on and let them go. You know, so we are able to slow them down, speed them up, point them on the ceiling versus the tables. When you say intelligent, that it's intuitive on its own, or there did did I miss that there is actually somebody running the lighting? For no, there's you? somebody actually running it. So when you hear the term intelligent lighting, it really is the fact that we can talk to the to the light fixture itself via a computer and tell it move left, move right, move up, move down, spin this fast, spin this slow, change this color. I mean, it's not you know the old days where you had a disco ball and a couple lights in a room. Um, every light can do every single item you could possibly get on a ceiling of a nightclub. So one fixture in a room can give you color, motion, pattern, tilt. It can do everything. So it really comes down to how many lights fixtures do you want in the mm -hmm, room? Mm -hmm. You know, it's quantity based. Okay. What do you do for daytime weddings? Um, yeah. So daytime weddings, um, again, depending on the venue. 
you know, are there windows? Are there not windows? You know, if you're at a hotel that, you know, it just has a typical, you know, um, rectangle room with a dance floor in the middle, even a daytime wedding can be a nighttime wedding. So it, it really does can't come up to the, what the client, you know, you know, expects and wants, you know, for their day um, with a window, full, full, th- a full venue of windows. Yeah. There's no reason to sell lighting. There's, you, you're just not going to see it. There's absolutely no reason. Even to for the dance it. floor. Even for the dance floor. Um, the, the competition from outdoors, it's too bright to compete. It just, it just ruins the effect completely. But there are other items, you know. So, you know, one of the most popular standard items is a photo booth. You know, a photo booths are on almost every job with us. Um, so your photo booths, dance floor wraps, you know, you can actually print logos on the dance floor versus, you know, projecting them with light. So there's a bunch of different things that, you know, you can do at a daytime wedding. Dance floor wraps, meaning um, like the logo in the middle? Logo in the middle or just completely the entire dance floor. You can okay. vinyl print the entire dance floor. So these, and those are actual, you know, newer trends. The last couple of years, you're going to, you know, I've seen a lot of this, you know, where the. So you need the dimensions of the dance floor prior to the event. Sure. And you have that printed and you bring it and you secure it. And it's, does it rip throughout the night as people are dancing on it? Does not rip. It's, it's secured to the floor. It even has an anti-skid like surface on it so that you don't slip. Um, It just changes the entire appeal of the room. You know, you can do an entire white dance floor with, you know, a gold or silver monogram in the middle. You know, you can do a black monogram, whatever you Mm -hmm, want. mm -hmm. Or you can print the entire dance floor, however, you you know, your heart desires, basically. Um, Photo booths. So is there a particular photo booth that you would say people are inclined to book these days? So the photo booth world is is, is changed based on technology. I mean... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Constantly, it changes. Um, right now, uh, we offer three different styles of photo booths. Um, one of them being a um, enclosed booth, like mm-hmm. you know the old Coney Island style photo booths mm-hmm. with a new twist on it, so it has a it has a nice look to it. But it's still the old style. You get inside mm-hmm. and sit down. Um, I call that more or less the kissing booth. You know, mm-hmm. it's you know two people, three people, maybe four. Um, <laughs> but um, the open air, it has become more popular because mm-hmm. of the idea that it's open to the air. You can fit 10, 15, mm-hmm. 20 people in mm-hmm. a picture if you wanted to. You're not stepping inside, you're standing outside. And images are given instantaneously, right? Every, exactly the same. They both they both print on instantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they both print instantly. Um, so, you know, you sit down inside a booth or you stand up in front of a booth. The same software, the same kind of idea is outputting the print. So it's four seconds and you have a print, you have a scrapbook, you can get frames, you can, you know have some fun over there too with the props and the, the signs. Are they able to text or email those images to themselves as well? So there is, there is the possibility of turning on text and email with all, all the photo booths uh, today. You can even do some social sharing if you wanted to include that as well. The problem is, is that the photo booth itself slows down, meaning that the process, the lines start forming. So if you have all these features turned on text, email, print, this, that, and the other thing, and people are actually entering their email address on the screen, the next person is waiting in line longer. The next person is wait, you know, waiting in line longer. So that basically, we make a mistake. Now I got a backspace. Oh wait, I want to text myself. You put the phone number in. It just makes everything last longer. The experience lasts longer. The next person's online. The next person's online. So it slows it down. So I always recommend do one or the other. Don't don't stand there waiting for prints if you're doing text. You know, don't don't text if you're waiting for prints. Okay. And vice versa. I think I might have said it twice the same way. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, th- I think we've all waited online at a wedding or any any large event for mm-hmm. an enormous amount of time. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And the photo booth can do that, and it can hinder your dance floor mm-hmm. if it's very popular. So a lot of times, I always recommend. You know, um, when I work the party, I'd rather have my photo booth there because I can open and close it also. So if your dance floor is suffering, I can walk over to my staff and say, just shut the photo booth down for the next ten minutes. Make an excuse. Oh, good point. And mm-hmm. get everybody back to the dance floor. Mm-hmm. And then the dance floor rebuilds, and then we open it up again and let it gradually build again versus forming some enormous line. So it's nice to have control over the gear in the room and the entire experience Smart. in the room, you know? I'm sure the couple appreciates that as well. Yeah. And which actually, this conversation leads me to the third photo booth also. I didn't mention it yet, but this eliminates all lines. Um, the latest uh, trend in photo booths in the last, I'd say, about year and a half, two years have become the roaming photo booth where it's really about text and email and social sharing. There is really no prints to, you can print from it, but it's really not worth it, to be honest. Um, but the photo booth comes to you. So um, What we, about props and backdrop in that case? Yeah, it's all digital. So it's all digital. You can you can digitally select back, backgrounds that we pre-select for you. So I can put a background of Paris, Italy, wherever, wherever you want to go, we can make your background. So how exactly does that work? 
it's kind of like magic. Uh, is it on an iPad <laughs> that they're choosing from? What was so, that experience like for the? So the experience yes. is a like almost like um, if you ever saw like a photographer with a ring light. Mm-hmm. So a big circle ring light and a, a giant iPad in the middle, basically um, coming to you. There's a person carrying it around with personality. So they're talking to you saying, hey, you guys want to take a photo with our photo booth? You can text yourself right now. And they hold this machine up and it's, you know, it's lightweight and it's right there next to them. And it's in your cocktail hour. Oh, it's, it happens during cocktail. It can, happen, it can happen anywhere you want it to be. So, Oh, a cocktail or reception. Exactly. So, Do they decide that? Um, I typically recommend that we start in cocktail hour. Okay. That way your dance floor doesn't suffer later and most Makes of your sense. guests have already used the photo booth. Now the, the photo booth, when it comes to your reception, can hang out at the bar. It can move around. It can float. It can come table to table if you choose. It can go on your dance floor. So they actually manually select, you know, backgrounds and things yeah, like that. Just like any other photo booth. You have a touch screen in front of you. Oh, cool. You, okay. you click a button that says, I want to do a boomerang. Ah. I want to do a magic background. I want to have a... I don't know. What's the other feature? It's um, props. Mm-hmm. There's digital mm-hmm. props. You what kind of props? Floating mustaches, hats, glasses, all the standard mm-hmm. stuff. Which is kind of cool because then you're not putting on the same hat that every other sweaty definitely, guest has put on that night. Definitely so. not worrying about lice by any means. <laughs> yeah. Got it. There's no physical props. They're all, it's kind of like Snapchat filters. You know, you have all those like, you know, quirky things where you can mm-hmm. just kind of, you know, click a button and everybody gets a mustache mm-hmm. in the photo. For the open air photo booth, what's your backdrop like? Um, it's kind of up to you. So basically what I I do is I lay out a bunch of choices and say, you know, we have these available. We buy more every year, different colors and, you know, options that, you know, appeal to people. Um, And even by request, sometimes we can do custom backdrops. So typically what happens is, is that, you know, you want to offset the the bridesmaids dresses or the color scheme of the room. You don't want the same color. So I recommend, listen, you know, talk to me first about the color scheme. You know, what do your flowers look like? What do your linens look like? What is the, what are the bridesmaids wearing? You know, if everybody's in blue, I don't want to put a blue backdrop up because they blend right in with the backdrop on the photos. Mm -hmm. So we try to do some contrast and I even, you know, I even try to help based on the venue. You know, the Mm -hmm. venue has gold, it has silvers, you know, okay, let's do a silver sequence. Let's do a gold leaf. And is it lit that way or it's the actual color? They're physical backdrops. So they're actual Mm -hmm. hung, hung, you know, eight by eight, you know, backdrops that are um, fabric. Um, Mm -hmm. And they do have pattern, they have texture. They have, you know, some some different various options. So um, we offer that first. And then if somebody wants something custom, you know, we can print the custom backdrop as well. So a lot of times you'll see like step and repeats or monograms in the background or logo design in the background, depending on how elaborate. The they client wants the the entire day, you know. What's the cost for something like that? The backdrop itself. A custom backdrop. Custom, custom backdrops aren't that expensive. They're they're I think just south of two hundred dollars. Oh, okay. So worth it for that extra little touch. Yeah. To have, but a lot of the monograms can be added after the fact when they're printing, right? They can put Most. their their date and like as though it's a souvenir. Most definitely. So on on all the strips that come out, or even the email or text that come to you, they come in the format with your logo or monogram on them. You can put hashtags built in, you know, so you can have your your bride and groom's hashtag for the day, hashtag the wedding and every photo. All digital. It it happens all digitally as well. So even from the digital standpoint, you still want to design the output, you know, so when you receive a text, it still has, you know, some customization. You mentioned briefly about band versus DJ and how, you know, old school, it was it was always standard to go with a band because it was that feeling of that very interactive feeling. Um, Now, I've heard a lot of instances where people will have sort of in between a band and a DJ, they'll have a a DJ throughout the night. Maybe they'll start to incorporate a percussionist or a saxophonist during the reception. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. It's actually one of my favorite things to do at a wedding. Um, I call it the hybrid as well. Um, (laughs) So it's, it's a hundred percent a hybrid to me. It's, it's for sometimes the parents that wanted a band and the kids wanted the DJ it's the best of both worlds. It's the best of both worlds. The, the proper fit for both, you know, the young and the old. Um, but at the same time, it adds an element of interaction like we were talking about before. And it can be really done cool if you have the right musicians. So when we bring out, you know, a saxophone player or an electric violin, it's someone that can like kill an EDM set, crush it at, during hip hop hour. You know, like they can really like cater to that style of music. But mm-hmm. then... If the parents wanted to hear some Motown, that saxophone just goes and, and has a great time also. Okay. So it can, it can really be dynamic. And um, musicians are amazing. They have an ear where they can hear a song for the first time and, and just pick it right up and start jamming with it. So I'm assuming that you're working with musicians that have this. Even though it might be music that they're not experienced with, there's a, a curveball song. Do they skip it or do they go right in and, and find their 
their jam with it. They're, so all our musicians have done this with us before. So they they're really in tune to the music, you know, styles that we're playing at weddings. They're again wedding people. They're not you know again coming off the you know. It's not a of, soloist coming out. Yeah, they're not coming out <laughs> of know. Cats Broadway, you okay. know, and just playing their part. You know, they're they're really trying to accommodate you know a wedding. So they understand you know what we're what we're doing, um, and we'll even extend their presence you know for, for the cocktail hour or even the ceremony sometimes. So during cocktail hour, you know, if you're having, you know, my sax player, I'm going to tell you, you know, he's really good at lounge music. So if you like mushroom jazz and you like that kind of like, you know, hip, slow lounge beat, let's play that and have him play along during cocktail hour. I'm not going to tell you that he's a great jazz musician because that's not his forte. But if you want him for the reception to crush it, this is the guy you want. So I have to, I have to know my talent. You know, if you want a jazz musician during the cocktail hour, yeah, he's gonna he's gonna know certain songs during the reception, but he's not gonna be the guy that I would hire for your reception typically. You know, so we, we want him to have the right pairing with everybody. So pairing the right musician, pairing the instrumentation. I mean, I can I can literally do three musicians on any wedding and all three you're gonna walk out going, they were the best things you ever heard at a wedding. You're like, My God, the band was amazing. And it was DJ music the whole time. What's most common with live musicians? Do they do a combination of musicians or do they typically stick with one? How does that work? Um, so yeah, so live musicians can pick up anywhere. So yeah, ceremony, cocktail hour, reception. So yes, uh, maybe different for each part of the wedding, but for the reception, one, two, or three usually. And how much of the reception do they participate in? I like to have them participate a lot. So the way I kind of control them is the violin, um, the saxophone are both plugged into our mixer. So we're controlling their volume. So they're playing, they can potentially play the entire night at the reception, but we control their volume so that they, we, we bed them into the music and then we'll feature them and highlight them in solo parts occasionally. But you don't want them taking over the crowd, taking over the, the dance floor. It's still about the bride and groom. It, where is your center of attention, you know, and how much do you get from these musicians? So we don't want to just focus on them the entire night. And when it becomes overwhelming, they take breaks. Um, just like, just like, um, human. yeah, you know, you need a break once in a while. So even like you know, people are eating, you know, they're, they're obviously taking a break or they could be featured during dinner. So you have to, we have to have that discussion. Do you want to feature, you know, a performance by a live musician during the entree? Maybe, you know, they shut down during, you know, a salad or a pasta course or something like that. But during the entree, maybe they can highlight, you know, and do like kind of like a, uh, what do you call that? A, um, like a mariachi style, like, you know, come to the table or something, you know, uh, table side, you know, uh, music, musicians, you know, you can, you can switch it up. Um, so we can, we can bring them back a little bit. We can stop them from playing. We can bring them up and feature them as well. Uh, the only one that can't be really be plugged in is we use uh, live live drums for percussion. Right, the drums. Mm -hmm. So our percussionists are really talented at making sure that their volume is controlled by playing with different instruments. Wait, they're drums. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. They're playing drums, but they're playing with different sticks. So mm -hmm. they'll play with hollow tube sticks. They'll play with solid wood sticks. They'll play with uh, fans and bells and different things to to have a full a full percussion experience. Mm -hmm. But they can soften it up and you know play more on the the toms. I never knew that. Stuff. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, because just having a drums just kind of beat away all day can be really loud. And it's it's from where they're playing. It's, you know, it's, the audio is coming right around them. Mm -hmm. So right at the head of the dance floor, you hear it bright and loud. And then the back, it starts to fizzle down. But if you're in the front of the dance floor, you know, it could be overwhelming, you know, to the first few guests. So it's nice to have someone that knows how to play the room and switch up what they're playing with sometimes. Do you have an opinion on which is the most effective? If you had to choose one musician to have as... You know, you, you can't afford all three. You can't afford two. You got to pick one. Do you have a recommendation? It's it's a hard question to answer only because it really comes down what, to what type of experience you want. And I can get a little more detail and explain that, meaning that, you know, a percussionist can give you a great audio experience. It can be as interactive as you see him playing the drums. And it's his personality a little bit too, you know, behind the drums. But he's not taking his whole drum kit and sliding it out to the center of your dance floor. So you're really interacting with him very similar to a DJ, almost like his drum kit is a facade. Um, can you come back and, you know, and, and bang away at the drums yourself 110%, you know, and, and we'll encourage that, you know, to make great photo and video for you. But the other musicians, violin and saxophone, they're wireless. So they can go right out into your crowd, get onto your dance floor, you know, interact, you know, create a circle around them if, if you wanted, you know, and kind of engage the dancing a little bit. Very cool. It almost seems bohemian to have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, it, it really, it's just a different, it really is a different experience. So mm -hmm. it, it really is when you have, when you have, um, that interactive feel or you want that interactive feel, Yeah. the, the live musician is the way to go, you know, along with the DJ. But you mentioned that, um, 
but they're they're plugged into a mixer. Yes. Okay. The violinist. The, the violinist mm-hmm. sax. Or all it's it, it, the violin's electric. Right. Okay. Which is cool in itself. Mm-hmm. The the saxophone has a microphone on it that we control the volume of. Um, so it's 100% in our mixer. We can bed it into the audio and we can mute it. So it's a matter of, you know, how much do you, do we manage, you know, their audio? Let's talk about the ceremony for a second. You know, we're on the topic of live music. How do you, uh, what's the conversation you have with your couples when it comes to choosing live music for their ceremony? Sure. So, um, if you're choosing live music over, over the DJ playing like a a program sound, you know, we decided on songs. Um, the conversation is, is somewhat unique because we have to find out a, the type of music that you guys want to hear. You know, so what are we walking down the aisle to? Is it classical? Is it contemporary? Is it something that's going to sound classical but be contemporary? Like a classical version mm-hmm. of a contemporary song. Exactly. And then I'm sure some couples might have for prelude music. Maybe they want some classical pieces, but then it switches, right, into something different. Yeah, and, I mean, couples ever do things like that? Usually I try to recommend a similar sound, so you're okay. not throwing the musicians completely off either. So if you're picking a, a, a contemporary sound to walk down the aisle to, I always recommend, why don't you have prelude music that's similar? So, you know, they'll play a couple of contemporary pieces. And then obviously when you walk down the aisle, that song, in, in my opinion, should be have a lot more fanfare. Mm-hmm. So it's more gonna, cohesive. Yeah, mm-hmm. It's going to be a, there's going to be a distinctive start to that song, regardless for the bride to walk down the aisle to. So even if it's a similar style of music, it doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, mean that people won't understand the transition. I, oh, I see. Mm-hmm. So if even if it's the same, you know, the same, it could be the same song, just with a different start in a sense. You know, just you need that that fanfare, that that trumpet type of sound in the beginning, something unique that's going to make the audience stand up and turn around and look for the bride. Are the musicians amplified for the ceremony? Um, depending. So um, a lot of string musicians start out with no amplification. Um, so for booking strings first, um, we we recommend four. So I always start with a quartet and then work down based on budget. Um, if you can afford a quartet and that fits into your budget, great, because it's going to give you a full band sound, um, you know, for the music that you're listening to, you're going to understand, you're going to understand the song and the second you hear it, you know, there's no listening and going, what is this song? You, you know it right away. It's a full band playing it. I, I think- was a violinist and I was in a quartet, so I okay. absolutely agree. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's where we always start. We try to sell the quartet first. It's the most, most, uh, complete sound. Um, do we need to have amplification with a quartet? Possibly, depending on the size of the crowd and where we are. You know, if we're outdoors and it's noisy and there's natural ambient noise and there's 200 guests sitting there, yeah, it's, it doesn't hurt to have, you know, some amplification. Now, that could be simple. I mean, one of my harp players that I work with brings a little battery-operated, you know, amp that she can plug in and it's pretty good for like, you know, 150 or 200 guests possibly. If it's more than that, we need to plug in, you know, a PA system. And we're there plugging in PA a lot anyway. So if we're putting a microphone out for the officiant and putting a PA, PA up for that anyway, we can always bring a, a mixer and plug in, you know, the quartet as well. Uh, so the conversation with the couple uh, when it comes to live music, it's basically sort of just finding out what style of music they're interested in. What style of music first? And I can pair the musician, obviously. Right. So I can right. say, you know, this this group is really great with that style of music. Okay. Uh, most of our musicians can can play everything, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's it's still nice to customize and fine tune who you're assigning, you know, to this wedding based on the style. Is it always strings that you're working with for the no. ceremony? No. So it's um it's also based on instrumentation. Mm-hmm. So you know mm-hmm. when you're you're speaking about a certain style, a lot of people see. Uh, I guess, movies in their head when they think about their wedding ceremony. And there's a guy, you know, with his pants rolled up playing the guitar, you know, out on the beach playing your wedding ceremony. That looks great, but it's a guitar. Um, I'm sure there's an entire orchestra bedded underneath him during that movie scene and no one realizes it, why it sounded so great. Because, you know, <laughs> right, the, the, right. The, it was, it, it's a movie. Um, so when we, we send a guitar player to your beach and you have 200 guests sitting there, the chances of you hearing the guitar are, are slim to none. Right. So we want to have an instrumentation talk also. So it's, you know, what, what are the right musicians for the sound you're looking for, for the look that you're looking for? Most, most majority of our customers are looking for beauty. They're looking for that harp. They're looking for the violin. They are looking for string over anything else initially because it is about more the presence and the beauty of having that instrumentation there versus a speaker in the back just playing the music. Um, but yes, we can we can filter in different sounds and different uh, dis- different instrumentation as well. So... Is there any sort of rehearsal that happens prior to the ceremony? Let's say that there's a specific song that the bride and groom would like to hear as they're coming down the aisle. Uh, you know, it, do they give the sheet music to the musicians or is it a pretty standard list that they're choosing from? It, they can play anything. So typically what we do is we request that you give us the music back about a month before that you're looking for. We don't need the sheet music. We'll find the sheet, sheet music ourselves. Um, if, the, if the musicians don't know the song, um, they will 
figure it out on their own. Uh, meaning they'll look at the sheet music, practice it on their own. And then before your actual ceremony, they're rehearsing and, and making sure that their, their cue points are together and that they're, you know, when they go live, you know, they're ready to go. Um, but they're again, quality of talent type of people that you're working with. I don't even have to worry about that. They're professionals. They know? wouldn't put themselves out there. Right. How long do they play for? So it depends on how the wedding's booked. Some venues are going to book a full hour sometimes for ceremony. Some only allot you about a half an hour. Um, most wedding ceremonies on site, I hate to say it, but take about 15 minutes. So even that half an hour time frame is fine. It's not something to be worried about, but a lot, some venues just, you know, if it's a, a venue for the day and you have it for the whole day, they're going to a lot more time for you. Uh, venues that, you know, tend to do more than one wedding a day. They're usually the, the, the time frame is a little bit tighter on you usually. So the question really comes down to how much time do you have? So I usually a lot our musicians by the hour. So if there's a ceremony, we book them for an hour. But if it's only a half an hour, you get them for half an hour. If it's the cocktail hour you want them to stay for, I always recommend once you have them for the ceremony, keep them for cocktail hour because the price to keep them that second hour is is almost easily absorbed. It's just, it's almost not there. So keeping the musicians for two hours and then transitioning to the DJ for the reception gives you kind of the best of both worlds. Um, you started with, you know, the live, live beauty side of things and then you went into really that, you know, that party atmosphere. So I kind of recommend, you know, keeping them, you know, for two hours. Circling back to a client, if they do want that guitar sound, what do you pair that with? Um, so it is heard. Any, anytime someone's looking for that one solo type of sound, I always say put a, a keyboard with it. So as long as, and I, let me rephrase that. I like to call it a piano, even though it looks like a keyboard, it's still an electric piano. Um, High quality. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's it's not a keyboard. A keyboard sounds very different than a piano. So I, I retract my, my last yeah. statement. <laughs> um, but yeah, a piano with any, any instrument. So if it's going to be a duo, I always try to put an amplified electric piano sound there. Um, that works well for two reasons. One, you're getting a full sound. You know, you're getting, you know, bass and G, and, G, and G clef. So you're getting a full sound. Plus now you have the guitar playing along with it. And then when you switch to cocktail hour, you still have two musicians that can kind of play anything. You, know, you can play a little bit of rock and roll. You can play a little bit of jazz. You can do anything with those two instrument, instruments. So generally when clients book live musicians with their ceremony, do, do they typically also, or do you recommend that they carry them into cocktail hour as well i do um anytime you can keep a musician there longer the price goes down basically a lot of musicians trying to get paid for the entire night in the first hour the rest of the night the price just continues to diminish and it's almost like booking a band by the end of the night you know you're paying by the musician so you know keeping them for six hours or one hour it could only be a few hundred dollar differential mm. okay makes sense because they've they've arrived they're, they're there they're they have there. their they, equipment they, they, is set up at it's less of an inconvenience. Right. And, and, it they're, keeps and the they're, not, they're not running around to four different gigs. They're doing one gig at night and they're going home. Right. So. And it kind of, for the couple, I, I would imagine it keeps the experience really kind of, I mean, it's all kind of blended nicely. Yeah. I mean, anything you can do with a wedding in my mind that can give you a great cohesiveness throughout the entire day, whether that means you created a monogram for your invitation and somehow it filtered all the way out to the center of your dance floor, to the TV screens over the DJ, to the bottom footing on your photo booth. Just bring it all together. Make it all, you know, make the symmetry happen. So if it's the musician starting at the ceremony, like you like you just mentioned, and keeping them all the way through the reception, you have a rapport with that person by the end of the night. You know, that that musician's playing for your day. They're excited to be there. And you're excited to have them because you've spent from the moment you got married with them right to the end of your party. So it's, yeah, I mean, cohesiveness is great. You know, tie it all together somehow, you know, and use use what you have to tie it together. I'm sold. <laughs> 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 Need to go through it all over again. Um, <laughs> one more question about quartet. Yeah. So I've always understood a quartet to be a first and second violin, a cello, and a and a double bass. But I've seen a lot of weddings where they incorporate like a flautist. What is your quartet, and is that open to the couple? They choose. Do you choose? How does that work? Yeah. So we can one hundred percent allow you guys to choose and put that 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 together. Um, I do offer the flute on a trio. Um, on my paperwork, but it doesn't mean that it can't be part of the quartet. So we can definitely change the instrumentation um, based on, you know, either more of a classical or modern style, you know, which one fits in better. Do you ask them, you know, uh, give me a recording of the song that you've been listening to? Because I'm, I'm sure that, you know, I like this song, but it may have to match with those particular instruments is how I would imagine. Sure. So I, my recommendation always is to hit YouTube. I think YouTube right. is the best source for this. Type in the song that you're looking for played by a string quartet. 
played by a, a jazz trio, played by you know, find the right arrangement. Let's let's listen to the arrangement and see what you're actually thinking about, and then pass that that link from YouTube to me, and then I send that off to the musician so that they they know exactly what you want. Great idea. Um, let's move back to the reception. Mm-hmm. You mentioned screens, you know, having the monogram put on the screens. And I've been to a lot of parties and weddings where they do have screens. I've seen them used in different ways. How do you use them? How do you recommend their use? Are they necessary? Sure. So TV screens um, at a wedding really come down to if you want to make a presentation first. If you have really no interest in making a presentation, the only reason you'd want screens there is basically to increase the size of the setup, you know, from the DJ, which is just, in my mind, somewhat useless because we need to fill it with content and filling it with content really should be about the bride and groom. So if you're about, you're a picture person, you're into pictures, you want to make a presentation or a montage display of you guys growing up or dating, or even just to take some of the pressure off of the bride and groom. This is the only other reason I would use a screen at a wedding if, you're, and does it loop the entire time? A set of so pictures? It, it can be it can be done a couple of different ways. Sorry, it can be done a couple of different ways. I typically recommend um, if you're into the music and the montage, and everybody's stopping and looking and watching, you do the one time montage during dinner, so that everybody's focusing their attention to the screens. They get a, a full presentation. You get the oohs, the ahs, the round of applause at the end. But if you're if you're just slightly more shy or you don't like the center of attention. You can use it where it runs the entire time. And maybe we use the screens more um, to take the pressure off of you. So if the bride and groom doesn't like the center of attention, they're on their dance floor for their first dance, put some engagement shots up on the screens. Take the pressure off just looking at them. It makes them feel more I comfortable see. on the dance floor. Mm-hmm. Diversifies the attention. Yes. And then during the parent dance, it's the same thing. Show some family photos. You know, while you're dancing with dad, there's pictures of you guys with, with your family, with dad, you know, spending uh, time growing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that, again, uh, to redirects everybody's attention to look at the old moments in your lives while you were growing up together versus just the picture of you know of you and down the center of the dance floor. Now, uh, one more, sorry, a question regarding the screens. Do you ever put pictures of the evening on the screens? Sure. Yeah, we call them zap photos. So basically, you know, we can send somebody around just taking some non-professional photos, first of all, first and foremost. Uh, definitely not your photographer. You need a photographer still. Um, non-professional, just taking some shots during cocktail hour of the venue, you know, outside, you know, if it's a nice day. Pictures of couples just having a good time. Pictures of the dancing, you know, and just kind of, you know, uh, put those up, you know, quickly onto the screen just to keep them active. Um, some people like this, some don't. So it's an option. Um, it's not a, uh, a standard. It can be done. But we want to keep the screens active. So you don't want to see a Sony logo floating around the screens. You don't want to see any of that stuff. So we want to put something up there about you. So whether it's, again, engagement photos, I think it's a great idea getting some engagement photos together, uh, creating a monogram or a logo or something that we can fill the screens with, you know, throughout some of the, the moments where you're just sitting down eating and and or that montage. How, how many screens do couples typically book? Um, so, you know, so it's a good question. So depending on the size of the wedding okay, is really where the number of screens comes in. So mm-hmm. if you're, you're a typical size wedding today, you know, 200 or so and under, you know, you're good with, you know, two good size screens in the room, you know, something 70 inches or something like that. Um, but if you have a large venue and your, your guest list is going up, you know, sometimes it does help to put screens in other parts of the venue. Which actually brings me to another question. Do you ever get any uh, requests for live streaming? From couples, or how, does that does that do you ever, do you work with that service with with for example videographers when they have large groups of people three four five hundred guests? So I've seen I've seen videographers work with us on their live streaming. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're we're semi involved in just mm-hmm. the audio side of it, you know, mm-hmm. and having everything plugged in. But I, th- I from my experience, it's been more people overseas that can't make the wedding. Um, so we're live streaming so they can be involved and see it, or someone's ill in the hospital. I've seen that for. You know, things like that where, you know, grandma can't make the wedding, but she wants to see what's going on. So they live stream it. Mm-hmm. But definitely, you know, we're, we're there to collaborate, but we're not there initially from the start. So they have the service and you provide the screens. Right. For that. Oh, you mean to the TV screens. I'm sorry. Yes. I thought yes. you meant video output. TV to somebody screens. Else. Oh, for the sorry. TV screens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we can do live, live, uh, live stream on the TV screens as well. Um, we do that a lot at our parties, not as much on the weddings. Even the zap photos on the weddings, people have kind of said to us in the past, yeah, we really don't need that. We don't want, you know, an extra photographer floating the dance floor, you know, type of thing. Um, but for the client that does want that, yeah, we can do their live streaming with, you know, like with GoPros, you know, and uh, and have the live video up there. Um, it, it has become more of a party item, though. It's not as much as popular on a wedding today for us, for us at least. Okay. 
Okay. Makes sense. Um, also, could you talk a little bit about your DJ setup? I've been to parties, weddings where it you see wires, it's pretty rinky dink looking. And then I've seen really cool looking setups where it's, you know, it looks like it was built there. What's yours look like? And how do you go about that? Sure. So um, it's scalable based on what we're what we're bringing to the wedding. So are we bringing lighting? Are we not bringing lighting? Are we bringing screens? Are we not bringing screens? And and so on and so forth. So it is scalable. Um, we start with the DJ facade, um, either white or black, and it can be uplit to match the decor of the room. Um, the black ones are obviously black, but the white ones we can colorize to uh, the uplighting in the room or the decor of the room so we can match and blend in a little bit better. Um, wires are, are never seen. Um, if there are wires, they are taped down. So we do use wires. Um, just to give everybody a heads up, there's definitely wires. Um, <laughs> the system's not wireless. Wireless is uh, is not the way to go with audio. Um, but, you know, we will run lighting wireless sometimes. But with audio, you want to make sure that we're live the entire time and you hear us. So it's wired, but it's taped down. It's clean. You're not going to find them in the room, I promise. And <laughs> our microphones are wireless. So we can have, you know, the, the best man toast or the maid of honor speaking from across the room. It's a non-issue. Um, so the setup's very clean um, in presentation. Um, you're not tripping on wires, I promise. Okay. And the uplighting, that's wireless, right? Up, uplighting, we do wireless um, and battery operated. So it's it's battery operated and it's wireless controlled. Oh, okay. I was like, wait, isn't battery operated wireless? Well, yes, <laughs> but we can also control you the can wireless. Control so I can it. change the color at any point in time. I can dim them, make them strobe, do whatever I want around the room as well. Okay. But it's all done completely wireless. Now, I've noticed that sometimes DJs will have different quantities available. So- what's the rule of thumb? You know, do you, how many do you need and why would you need more or less? I, clearly the room being bigger is going to require more, but what's the rule of thumb on that? Is it per certain amount of feet you should space them out? Sure. What's the consideration? I, I try to say just about every 10, every eight to 10 feet, we drop a light basically. Um, so based on the size of the room dimension, um, I've gotten good at selling this over the years based on number of people in the room. So if I don't know the venue, which is rare, but if I don't know, I don't know the venue, I've never been there. I'll say, how many guests do you have? And they'll say, oh, we're having 150 people. And I'll say, okay, well, that room size, if you fit, you know, in a, in a room that fits 150 people, you didn't book an oversized room, maybe about 12 to 18 lights, you know, and depending on the budget, you know, how much of a wash do you want? Because all it's going to do is if I use 18 in the space that only needed 12, it just reduces my 10 foot space to eight feet and gives you more of a wash on the wall versus a, a pin spot on the wall. Mm. So the tighter we get, the more wash you get. Um, basically every light has about, and this is hard to, to imagine sometimes about a 20 degree dispersion. So figure 10 degrees to the right, 10 degrees to the left is where you're getting the pattern on the wall of that, that, that wash. Well, wow, you are really specific, really specific. Yes. Um, <laughs> so at every eight feet or so you will have a gap in between slightly, the darker the room, the less gap, the less okay. you're going to see. Okay. Well, yeah, 12, 12 to 18 lights typically on a, on a decent size party, um, larger, you know, it's good to get the floor plan and map it out. Do you ever use, um, let's talk about speeches and, you know, best man, maid of honor. How is the amplification working for that? Are you using wireless? Are you, are they hold, like, how does that work? Yeah, it's all handheld microphones. They're all wireless. You can roam the room with them. Um, okay. We try to direct the person speaking to one location so that they're you're kind of fixed, you know, and Typically, it's based on the photography and video's perspective. So Do you ever they, have like a best man that goes on and on, like too many drinks? And, oh, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes they'll even, you know, start to make it more of a roast than a toast. And you, you got to kind of, you got to find a way to shut them down a little bit without, you know, so what do you do? <laughs> um, how do you, eat, how do you even approach that? <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, it's, it's come to a point where I had to learn one trick and one trick only. And it's it so the many years. Is it the little finger, the finger <laughs> rotating, you the know, clock. wrap it, it up. You, you, usually what, you, usually what you see is the bride and groom's Sorrow. faces, like, you know, kind of in shock. Sure. And you know that it's okay to say something now. So I'll take my microphone and I'll say something like, uh, Hey, Brian, anytime you want him to stop, just let me know. And <laughs> okay. I'll just kind of interject and I'll get a yes or no for the bride and groom when I say that. Uh -huh. And then at that point, the best man will know, okay, I got to, I got to move on here, you know? Uh -huh. Sure. Yeah. So uh -huh. I put it, I put it back on the bride and groom to make that final decision, but I'm not shutting them off by any means. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or the poor, like, best mans that are too drunk and just can't finish the speech. They can't get through it. Like, That's right. <laughs> or you have yeah. our wedding. We had the worst speeches. They were so short, unprepared, and 
they were over and we were looking at each other going, is that it? Was, wait, was that the speech? Like, <laughs> I, I am so guilty of that. So I've, I've been, I told you I'm doing this 30 years. You can put a microphone in front of me. I'll talk all day. But at my friend's wedding as the best man, I'm like, yeah, congratulations. You just- <laughs> and they're looking at me like waiting for this long speech. And I'm like, yeah, we know each other. I have nothing else to say to you. Like, that's it, you know? Is that a guy thing? Like, all the best to you in the future. Have a nice life. Right, right. I, I don't, what else do you say? You know, I'm terrible at it. Yeah. That's amazing. All your other best friends, like, note that, you know. Oh, they make fun of me because I've, I've done uh, best man speeches at least three of my friends' weddings. And as we're leading up to the second they one, didn't the third one. They didn't learn on the first one? They're like, we have to make you the best man. Just, are you going to speak this time? Nine words. Yeah. So I, I, nine. Yeah, I, went, I went from, like, maybe six to nine to, like, 12 by the third time. Yeah. You picked it up. Um, Jamie, talk Talking about add-ons again, um, do you get a lot of requests for for uh, sparklers? We do. So sparklers um, have become a trend in the last year or so. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, um, and we're not talking about the sparklers like the champagne comes in in the VIP room. You know, <laughs> no, we're no. Talking, we're I, actually, about- I've seen that at weddings recently also. Um, so some, <laughs> some some weddings have had that. I don't get involved. That's somebody else handling it. Um, <laughs> but um, the sparklers we're talking about are more highlight moment sparklers. So I I recommend them for the first dance. Um, can be used during the introduction as well, but for the first dance is when I recommend them because nobody knows they're there. They're cold, indoor cold sparklers. Um, they they run internally hot, but externally you can't burn yourself. You can put your hand right into the spark and you won't even get a burn. Um, so they're they're allowed to be used indoors. They don't set off fire alarms. There's there's none of that to worry about. Um, but the 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 hidden factor, the surprise moment, is what it's all about. So when the chorus hits during your first dance, you're the only two people on the dance floor. We send up, you know, an eight foot sparkler from like four fountains and it just kind of basically rains sparks in the room. Um, Sounds very Disney. Yeah, it is very Disney, actually. It's probably where it came from. Um, <laughs> everybody in the room goes, whoa, like it's it's a wow factor. It's that highlight moment during your first dance that nobody else can really uh, understand how it just happened. Uh, right. So explain to me, I'm just trying to visualize this. How are they set up exactly? The setup is basically um, along one side of the dance floor. Okay. So we basically line up um, these fountains on the floor uh, about every four feet or so along the dance floor. Mm-hmm. Um, I typically bring out four. Okay. Um, so we get about a 12 foot span and each fountain can go as high as 10, 12 feet in the air. Oh, wow. So, so it's, only on, oh, it's only on one side. One side. Okay. Yeah. Typically doesn't, doesn't have to be. Um, the problem is when you space them out, they are wired. So they, there are extension cords. There are wires, you know, linking to each, to each one. Cause we are controlling these VR lighting software as well. So um, we're telling them how to, you know, how high to go and how long to last and all that kind of stuff. So there are wires on this. The technology for wireless really doesn't work well on these, these items. So we try to keep them together. And you control them from the... From, it's from our lighting software, the, the computer we're using Got for it. lighting. Okay. Um, basically has uh, DMX profiles where we can tell it how oh. high, how long, you know, and so on and so forth. So, you know, if the ceilings are eight feet, they can't go eight feet. They have to go seven and a half feet. But we try to hit almost to the ceiling. Okay. okay. Something I forgot to ask you earlier. When does a couple meet with the DJ or the MC? So typically the MC is the manager of the of the show. Mm-hmm. So any interaction, a lot of times it's just a phone call. It's you know a conference call, a FaceTime type of type of call um, with the MC. So at least you have some interaction with that person, and you can kind of get an idea of who their personality is, as well as give them a lot of your details and specifics firsthand. So you understand they're working for you, not somebody else. It's not just a, a paper, you know, uh, of information. It's a face and a, and and all your request Mm -hmm. are you in your experience are couples are they hung up about that are they real is 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 their mc very important or is it just is is there an element of trust where they just say you know they speak to you and right so in in yesterday's world going back a little bit Mm -hmm. the mc was super important um in today's world i still sell by mc so i still propose the mc first no matter how i slice it because i feel the mc is the senior uh person on the team um, all of our MCs were DJs in the past. So the DJ that can read the dance floor, it's on the dance floor in my mind is very valuable. So I always lead with the MC. They're also the personality that you're interacting with. So you want to have some rapport and comfort, you know, a comfort, uh, zone with them. You want to be able to talk to them and communicate with them. Like, you know, them, however, the clients that I'm getting on the phone and in my office, uh, recently have cared more about music and the DJ. So I've had to explain, you know, that the MC is, is technically a DJ, but they're bringing their DJ with them and they're going to be reading the crowd together and working together and had to kind of, you know, kind of switch their thinking a little bit that the MC's role is really important. Um, 
They're directing the DJ. Yeah. I mean, they really are the director of the entire ship, you know, for the reception. So it's it's even talking, like I said before, talking with the venue. Hey, guys, you know, food's coming out in 10 minutes. Hey, can you give me an extra three? I want to make sure this set finishes the right way, that people are loving it, you know, and really trying to manipulate the party so you have the best energy on the dance floor. I didn't realize how many components that you really have to observe and man, you know, all at once. It's it's juggling a lot, and the experience would play yeah. hugely. You're controlling the lighting. You're looking at the energy of the dance floor. You're looking over at the photo booth. Is everybody gathered over there? Let me shut that down, bring them back to the dance floor. Do we need to bring the music down because it's dinner time? What kind of music? This speech is going on too long. Wrap it up. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things yeah. happening. and only experience would be able to give you, you know, that, that trust factor of somebody being able to handle the I, evening. I, I agree. And I, I'll even, I'll take it a step further. I think anybody that has experience is even doing more than that because over the years you looked, you actually learned to look for things that you would never expect. So something's happening in the corner of the room. There's, you know, a scuffle going on, you know, what's going on. <laughs> we don't know what it is. You see an energy around it and people pulling from the dance floor towards it. And you need to diffuse that right away. So you don't lose the party. So, so what do you do? You're looking, for, you're looking for things that you don't normally would see at a wedding. What are your diffusing tricks? Uh, it's getting right in the middle. You know, you, you got to get over there and find out what's going on and Break take it, it up. Take it out of the room or take it back in the room. You know? Oh, you do that. You're that guy. I'm that guy. So you're um, a bouncer. And I'm not, I'm not, well, let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's clarify where we're going yeah, with yeah, this. Yeah. I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's, it's a fight you know, or a scuffle, <laughs> a, a scuffle of, a, of that sort in the corner scuffle, of the room. That will be my new word. Yeah, scuffle. scuffle. Where am I getting all this vocabulary today? Um, <laughs> So yeah, I'm not I'm not insinuating that there's fights at weddings because they <laughs> right. really shouldn't be. Right. Um, but what I'm saying is, you know, there could, there could just be you know a disorderly, you know, over overly intoxicated person in the corner of the room, just you know, making their family bring attention to that side and diffusing it, not letting the bride and groom really know what happened, and kind of get it out of the room, get it handled, and keep the flow of the party going. So you're looking for anything that can really throw the the party off the rails. You know, you really want to keep the party on the rails. So it could be, yeah, it could be a scuffle. <laughs> <laughs> it could just, it could, it really, it could be anything. It could be the buffet was, you know, didn't open when it was supposed to. It could be that, you know, food wasn't being served when it was, when it was supposed to. You know, I've had food come out 10 minutes too early mm -hmm. and the dance floor just starts drifting on you. You're like, what just happened? You need to be in sync with, with the venue. I see. Um, when you speak to your, to your clients, once you kind of, um, uh, understand their personality types do you then suggest an MC to them is that what you're saying based on what you understand about them i think they're going to be really good with this person and you'll ex you'll explain to them why 110 percent. okay like it needs to be done that way um i can show you video all day long of a million different weddings it's somebody else's wedding it's how we listen to that customer and accommodate that one customer so now the video of that job looks like it's for and tailored to that customer so the MC's role will vary on how they interact and don't interact. And based on their personality and how big it is, they might not be right for a certain client either. You know, if you want a laid back feel, I can tell you right now, two of my MCs are not laid back. And do they <laughs> want to be laid back? Absolutely not. They want to have that energy in the room. They want to have fun with you. Not Makes laid sense. back. Oh, I see what you mean. More energetic, more forward yeah, they're, in they're, their energy. They're, they're, they're on the center of the dance floor. They're in all your photos. You know, they're, they're going to be, they're oh. going to be noticed. You're not mm -hmm. missing them, you know? So, if, you know, if you want that style and you like that interaction, you like someone kind of really bringing the crowd together, that's great. But for some people, it's not. So you need to listen, you need to learn, and you need to make that recommendation as to, mm -hmm. you know, what, what party it is and whose party it is. How long does it take you to set up? And I mean, I know that has to also has to do with, you know, the lighting and what they're booking. But I guess the question is, how early do you tend to get to sure. these these venues? So it's, it's handled two ways. We're going to we're going to contact the venue on a Monday before your wedding and okay. just talk about loading times and what else is going on there. OK, so we're already privy to, OK, we have a party ending at five. You guys are starting at seven. You can't get here before five. So we know there's a two hour window. We assign staff accordingly to make sure that we can get everything that you booked set up in two hours. If we have all day or the night before, we've done that before as well, you know, so we'll, we'll talk to the venue and find out. However, it's nice to at least have two hours of padding just for audio. And then when you start adding other items in photo booths and lighting and everything else, we just keep padding our setup time. So it could be three hours. Mm -hmm. And if the couple ends up booking live musicians that are there for the ceremony, I would assume that you coordinate that timing. Yes. You, know, you let them know, okay, you guys got to get there by uh, 12 or whatever the case is. Exactly. I mean, if you book live musicians, you're booking a photo booth, you're booking the DJ, we coordinate all the times. There's mm -hmm. nothing for you to worry about. It, mm -hmm. it is, it is a completely managed task by us. 
So the musicians will be there, you know, a uh, half an hour to an hour before your ceremony starts to just rehearse and play together. Mm -hmm. They've played together before, but now they're actually playing your songs together. If it's something, you know, specific and custom, they can rehearse again one last time. Their prelude music is ready when someone walks in the door. There's no gear to run in and out. Everything's done. Can we talk a little bit about the other vendors? So uh, photographers, and, you know, videographers. Um, do you have a need to speak with any of these vendors prior? Is it, you know, to talk to me about that. Yeah, so um, it's great to know who you're working with. Uh, photo and video wise, it's very important for the reception. So once we once we know who we're working with and we have a rapport with them, you know, we're. I mean, we 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 make everybody aware of what's happening anyway. But it's 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 easy when you see the same people every week and you work with them to go, okay, hey, you know, um, we're doing the toast next, you know, and they're running to help you get the toast done. So it's nice to work in symmetry throughout the reception, but sometimes there's a reason, even reason to speak to someone earlier on. So, and what I mean basically is, well, if there is something happening where, you know, the photographer is showing pictures on our screens, well, we want to talk about how they get them there, you know? So it's, it's nice to talk to the photo and video people beforehand. If a montage is being produced outside of our, our, our office and they're bringing it to us, I want to know what format it's in, where it's going, how's it being shown, when it's being shown. If they're playing it, if I'm playing it, you know, things like that. So it is good to talk to photo and video beforehand, but then more importantly, during reception, just reception, just having a rapport with that person. You know, you seem really open and, uh, you know, easy to work with as well. Like if video videographers need to tap into your soundboard to be able to get the, from the speeches, the sound from the speeches, you're pretty open to that and sharing your equipment with them, right? Most definitely. I mean, the, the ultimate goal is to make the party great and the bride and groom super happy. So whatever it takes to make that happen. Great. Um, so day of the wedding, you're there. Um, do you test your, your sound levels once the equipment is set up? Do you test the lighting? Everything is good to go. Um, how do you gauge how loud the music should be, how soft it should be? Um, so yes, everything's definitely tested. Okay. Um, we're there super early. I know we were just talking about that, uh, setting things up could take half an hour, but we're there two hours before three hours before sometimes. And it only takes a brief amount of time to get the gear in and set up. But at the end of the day, it's really about testing. We want to make sure everything's up and running, r running to our liking. The lighting is programmed to the dance floor, not to your guest tables. No one's getting a strobe light in their eyes for four hours. All these things are looked at before we actually go live. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it sounds funny, but it's true. You right. know, you, I can turn a light on and say, listen, it's set to the music and it's just going to go and it's going to have fun. And your table is going to get majority of the light just based on the fact that you're sitting at a table that happened to be in the beam of that, you know, that, that pre-programmed setting in the light. So you're sort of analyzing the whole space and, and you work with the lights prior. Yeah. So as mm -hmm. soon as we set up, um, again, going back to that intelligent software, we can actually tell the light where the dance floor is. So the majority of its work is on that dance floor. So you basically just adjust the X and Y axis and tell it where this is where the dance floor is. So your light, your lights are really primarily working that area. They'll touch the ceiling, they'll touch the walls, they'll touch the floor, but they're not going to spend all day on table number nine. <laughs> what do you do if a guest complains? It's still loud. This so, light is in my eyes. What, why do you always have to make it sound like they're 90? Because <laughs> that's, that's, usually, that's usually who's complaining, right? Um, one, so, so there's, Sorry. There's, there's, this is good. There's two, ways to, there's two ways to handle this. You can do this in advance of the actual wedding. You can talk to the, the, your customer and say, listen. Seat them away from the sound. Old people don't sit near the sound. You know, we're not running surround sound. This is not your living room. This is a venue with speakers on one side going the other direction. Put us near the dance floor. Don't put your tables on top of the dance floor. And the older crowd, seat them all the way by you guys on the opposite side of the room. Moral of the story, grandma sits on the side by of the By you. Well, yes. <laughs> Maybe not grandma, yes, but. Yes, exactly. Okay. You know, so, then, so young friends, young cousins, you know, put them, yeah. put them near us. They're going to be up dancing anyway. Now, it does happen. People are going to, people regardless, are going to get seated where they don't want to be seated or complain about volume. So two things are actually happening at the actual wedding itself. One is we have our speakers above head level. So they're traveling over your tables, the audio. It's not just directed straight down at your table. So it's overhead. They're at a high level. They're also aiming more towards the dance floor than anything else. So we're trying to reduce that regardless. Um, however, it does happen and we get the request to lower it. And with technology today, all of our speakers have amplifiers built in and I can peel back just from one speaker if I wanted to. Oh. So if the left side of the room is complaining more than the right side, I can lower the left side a little bit Okay. and vice versa. However, um, 
usually just bringing the volume down just a little bit mm -hmm. is helpful. If you bring it down too much, you are losing an energy in the room that most people don't understand. And there's an energy level or a volume level, even more importantly, that people are going to dance to. When it's quiet and the music is great, they're not getting up and dancing. They have to feel the music as well as hear it. So the Otherwise experience it's awkward. is awkward. Have you ever tried awkward. to dance where the music level is too low? It's so... <laughs> Like if I can hear Mark speaking to me, yeah. like on the dance floor, that then I'm not, I'm not, I'm shutting down. Very awkward. <laughs> exactly. That's right. And and that's the, the problem. With, <laughs> that, that's the problem with people. Um, screaming. When people ask to lower it, they don't, they don't realize that they're just looking mm -hmm. for their, you know, protect their their own uh, conversation. How about guests requesting music? How does that work? So first, we have a request list from the bride and groom. Um, I tell all of our customers in advance consider your guests in that list. Don't just give me what you like. Give me what you think your friends and family are going to dance to. On that list also, I have Do Not Play. So there's certain <laughs> songs that Brad and Groom are telling us, you're absolutely not playing these songs at my wedding. That gives me two things. It gives me middle ground, and it also gives me a response to the customer that comes over in the middle of the party and says, can you play this song? Well, it's on the Do Not Play list. <laughs> so I don't have to, right? I'm never going to say that directly to them, but I already know it's already a no. So, what if it goes against the, what if they want, you know, you're building the party and there's this awesome energy happening and they request like this really depressing song that's meaningful to them. You you don't do it, right? We burn a CD and we let them <laughs> listen to it on the way home in the car. Hilarious. Now I'm getting self-conscious because there was a few times where I requested songs and the DJ's like, sure, sure. And they just never played it. <laughs> so I, I'm going to tell you right now. Was I yes to death? You... I have, I have a few memes for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's definitely a few of them. Um, if someone comes over and requests a song, which does happen, and 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 I like to say that it doesn't happen frequently. Okay. And the reason I say that, if the party's going well and everybody's having a great time, there's no reason to ask the DJ for a song mm -hmm. because you're out there having a great time. Why that's, would you stop to go ask? Usually you're asking because you're either really good and you think you're a DJ and you really <laughs> feel that you know what the next song should be. And you're trying to get that along. And that's usually after you hit the bar all day. And that's where Askaholic comes in. Um, <laughs> but if it's an actual request because you like the song, most of the time, if it fits into the party, we're going to play it. Okay. It's just finding the timing. So, okay, it's a depressing song. Yeah, it's probably not going to happen. But if it's in line with what the bride and groom already discussed with us, and this is the serious note. You gave me a playlist and you gave me a do not playlist. If it fits in the middle or it fits into the play side, we can play it. So just curious, do you have like the same 10 songs as first dance songs that get played? You know, yeah, the first dance becomes more of like, you know, you hear the same song over and over again. But I think a lot of people today put a lot of effort into finding the song that's going to be different because they don't want to go to their friend's wedding and their friend's dancing to it. And the then they go to their song. cousin's wedding and their cousin's dancing to it. So they do try to find something The people unique. are cognizant of it. They are. They definitely are. And they, and they have this conversation. They procrastinate on picking that song almost to the end sometimes. So I've seen a lot of classic um, songs used for first dance, you know, going back to the Sinatra days, you know, and just trying to wait for what comes out brand new, which slow love songs, unless it's country music right now, hasn't really been popular. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. You know, I got to ask you because we kind of skipped over this, but at, being that a wedding is a live event and you can't really, they're, they're, it's a really unforgivable event because it is live. What's your plan B? Like, what do you do if, if equipment's not working? If if one of your up lighting is like, you know, the battery's low and it's it goes out. What's what? How do you handle that? You have to have backup. You're not okay. bringing just what they booked. You're bringing extra. Um, speaking of up lights, you know, if you booked 18 up lights, there's probably six of them in my setup as well. And I probably have even more than that in the truck just to go around. Um, how do you get it? I mean, do how do you? I mean, that's a good point. How would you fix that? Because I'm, I'm assuming to set up up lighting, you're on. Well, no, up lights on the floor. Oh. So they're they're sitting on the floor okay. and they're up lighting the walls. So they're easy to swap oh, out. Oh, got it. Those okay, are easy okay. to swap mm -hmm. out. Um, everything else, though, keep in mind that we just tested it right before the start of your reception, and we have to have it working for about four hours. So obviously, we're buying quality equipment, maintenance our equipment on a regular basis, so that it doesn't have a failure. Mm -hmm. um, Sixty percent of our failures are wire based. So yearly we exchange wires and get rid of the old and bring in the new to avoid these problems, you know, so they're avoided to begin with, but then the extra equipment's there. If a speaker just dies for some reason, we have an extra speaker. You know, we're not just coming with two speakers. We're coming with four, you know, okay. there's, there's backup in the truck at all times. Have you ever had any sort of sound nightmares at a venue? Oh, you want to bring that up? Nightmares. <laughs> well, you know, um, you're bringing your own speakers. You're bringing all of your own equipment. It's tested, tried and true, but sure. you know, you're also using their power. 
So has this ever happened? And what oh, do you yeah. do? We've, we've been hit by lightning. Um, so I've, I've been in a, in a massive storm. What's your clause for lightning? How do you, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's your backup? I think that clause is called a, um, what is that called again? Hold on. That is a, uh, there is a clause for that. Hold on. You're the okay. alcoholic. Let's wait gonna, for the next one. I, was say. <laughs> I know, I know the clause. I'm trying to think of what it's ter- the terminology is, but there is a clause, uh-huh. uh, natural, na- natural disaster, act of God's clause. Yep. You know, um, unfortunately we still, again, are trying to accommodate the customer if, Everything just got fried for some particular reason, and there's no power at the venue. You're hoping the venue is going to have a backup generator. Okay. Um, if they don't, for some reason, you know, you're you're pulling your cocktail speaker out that ran on battery and trying to get the next three hours out of it. You're doing whatever you can at that point because you're a trying candle. to make the party. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You can start clap rhythms on the dance floor if you wanted to, but you know, the ultimate goal is to have a great party still. So um, that's more of a question for the venue. What's their yeah, backup? Yeah, the, ven- the venue should have a backup outages. plan for power. Um, actually, I was just at a venue recently. Over the winter and the entire facility, I'm not just not even the venue, but the entire facility, lights in the parking lot, lights on the hotel, the entire thing went out and it came right back on slowly and nobody, the, the staff didn't even know they lost power, but there was a generator in the parking lot powering everything the oh, entire time. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. that's a good backup plan. So, you know, having, you know, uh, a conversation with the venue about that is really important. Um, for us, you know, equipment failure could happen during a lightning strike as well. But again, backups for everything. What about backups for your team? Like, how many people do you work with? Um, you know, DJs, MCs. What's that like? Like, how big is your team? And then also, what's the plan B if somebody gets sick? Sure. So the the most important thing for us is quantity of staff and and number of jobs that we book on a single day. So um, we're a company. You know, I'm just not by myself. I, you know, obviously, there's. Um, I would say that's one of the most important things that I think any any customer should know. You know, if I worked out of my house and I was by myself and I got sick, who's doing your wedding? You know, it's not me. You know, there's 40 people around me. Um, right now we have a staff compiling just just about 40 exactly. And we book five weddings a day. Oh, oh, I see. So you um, have you have those redundancies. Right. So ready and, to go. and not all 40 have the same role. Right. But there's still 40 of us. And if I'm booking five parties on one day. There's a team dedicated to backup. That number six team is on backup. They're on call basically for the day. They're I getting see. paid for the day. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Um, to be on backup. So if something did happen, um, they can get in their truck and leave. That's great for peace of mind. How yeah. many DJs and how many MCs? It's a good question. Um, so the number the number does vary a little bit. Um, and the reason I say that is because we do hire um, as we grow. And right now, I want to say there's about seven MCs. And we have obviously seven DJs to, to stand behind them, but there's probably about two or three DJs in the makings right behind them as well. So they're, they're working so their way. So who's everybody that. else? Who's the 40? Uh, photo booth personnel. So you oh, have a photo okay. booth. There's an attendee with that photo booth. There's setup crew. There's lighting crew. There's, you know, there's a bunch of different staff that, you know, knows how to use our dry ice machines and our sparklers and everything else. That's right. How diverse is your team for all the different cultures that you're uh, working with? We're, we're pretty diverse based on requests. So, you know, um, we do have team that's, you know, um, very good with, you know, the Italian market, the Spanish market, um, the American market, you know, obviously, you know, but, you know, it, we really are more of an American DJ company, meaning that if you're living here, you're still looking for an American style wedding. We're not going overseas to work for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so if as long as you're 50 percent or more American on terms of the, the layout of the music, you know, we're pretty accommodating. You know, it's it's beyond that. It's more of a spoken word that we're concerned about. You know, if you need someone to speak in, a, in another language, you know, we definitely, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian. Uh, uh, recently, we had a request for Mandarin. We had to find somebody. So it's, it's, it is possible to accommodate, you know, multicultural, you know, events. It's just based on request. And sometimes the music is the hardest part. So having, you know, a request for, you know, um, a wedding where we've never played the music before. You know, we don't have a DJ that's experienced with that culture. You know, it's important for the bride and groom to outline that music for us. You know, so these are these are traditional songs that are going to be done in a circle dance, you know, and in that circle dance, you know, you can't play this song, you know, stick to these two or three. You know, it's, it's important to have some instruction and spend more time with the customer on the music. And you compile that with traditional American songs as well. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I, and I'm just thinking of an exact example. I've done probably probably about 100, 150 Arabic weddings. And when I'm working in an Arabic wedding, I don't understand Arabic. I don't speak the language. Um, but for some reason, they continue to hire me. And it's, it's, it really comes down to they, they like my voice. They like my presence, you know, in the room. 
as an MC. And communities are tight too. So once you've are. done one wedding and, and they had a great time, then they'll recommend you and it's word of right. mouth. So, I mean, the entire families have, have used me for all their weddings and they'll put an Arabic band next to me, you know, and, and, and let the Arabic band handle the Arabic music. But I still need to know the culture and the background and how the, the, form, the formula for that day is going to work. Because, you know, you, you need, to, if you're emceeing the party, you, you're talking to the entire audience and keeping that flow also. That's right. So. And there's a lot of cultural things that are introduced during the reception as well. Yes. Is there any uh, culture you have not serviced before? It's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm sure there is. Alcoholics. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, um, guys. Uh, I really was just wondering. I mean, depending on how you want to break up the world, I, yeah, I'm sure there's got to be a void somewhere. Um, but... Yeah, off the top of my head, I've no, I know uh, most popular for us uh, a lot of Jewish weddings, um, a lot of Italian, Spanish, like I mentioned, Portuguese. Um, I've done Russian, I've done Greek. I mean, we've done. All, I mean, yeah. Indian weddings, like I've done Indian weddings in India. Um, I just mentioned we don't do that normally, but you know, um, their their weddings are a little unique. The Indian wedding in India could last over a week, sometimes two. Um, so they wanted, they wanted to bring an element from the U S back home. So yeah, we've even done that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it just about everywhere, uh, we performed, um, as well as for anybody, you know, there's, there is no limitation really. It's just a matter of how do we accommodate you to your liking? What are some of the differences working with, you know, different generations, millennials, now this up and coming generation Z, they're starting to get engaged. So what, what are some of the trends that are different? You, you've been around for decades now, and is it is it? <laughs> this made me sound really old, by the way. Decades. <laughs> you've been around decades. for 110 years. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no, so, I'm, I, I trust me, I'm still relevant. You said you go you go with the flow. <laughs> you know, you you're always learning, you're always growing. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Like, what's your experience with all this? Yeah, and what uh, are specifically like some of the things that have changed? All right. So besides being old. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yes, I, I've, I've been around, I've been, I've been around for decades. Um, <laughs> oh so the difference, the difference really is this, the difference was 30 years ago when I got hired to DJ someone's wedding, I got hired cause they had to have the music I played. You, you were, you were, wait, okay. They had to have, you were hired because they had to have, you were like a, a niche DJ. Like you only played I, a, there was of- very few wedding DJs some 30 plus years ago. And <laughs> that's why I said, de- like, just right. for the record, <laughs> for the record, the reason I said decades is I couldn't remember if you said 20 years or 30 years. So I was right. just covering, I, you know, yeah, yeah. and I started DJing when I was five. So we're good. Um, <laughs> so, um, so basically 30, 30 or so years ago, when I started DJing, we were playing, you know, with vinyl records. So you couldn't bring 50,000 songs to a party. You were lugging the physical music into the party. So back then with this, this idea, you had to have your, your prepared sets for a wedding in a sense. Like you, even if you played a nightclub, you brought your prepared sets to the nightclub because you didn't want to carry your entire collection with you. You only carried, carried what you needed. It was on records. I remember that. Yeah. So, um, records were, I'm great at my sets at a wedding. So other people hire me for that. If they requested a song and I didn't have it, there was no option. I wasn't going online and downloading it. So the the shift in that has changed dramatically because now we're bringing in fifty thousand songs you on can a hard drive, it on the, on and the I can spot. and I can grab something on the fly if I had to. So the the technology has forced a lot more people to say they're DJs because they have oh. access to fifty thousand songs on the internet at any point in time. Sure, it's more and, accessible, and you can accommodate anybody and make their party now. So the 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 shift has also come from that standpoint based on I want my party versus you play your party, which I think is great. I think it's a, one of the reasons I'm still in business is because I like accommodating people and making sure that they're happy with the outcome of, of what we did. Um, but the unfortunate side is communicating that to the customer has changed. The interaction with the customer has come down to uh, an email back and forth about, you know, do you offer this? Are you available? And what's your price? You know, versus... Hey, I want to come meet you. I'm excited to meet you. You're you're a great DJ. I want to know you. I want to get to know you and find out how you can play my wedding. It's kind of flip flopped a little bit. So it's so it's re- more about what can you what what can I get for a certain amount of money? Right. What value am I going right. to get? But the value is a dollar sign rather than the experience that goes behind it. Exactly. And I think that's just just because the this this newer generation is so used to shopping on their phone, shopping on Amazon getting things in a, in a moment's time and getting the answer, you know, instantly. 
Um, I think I read an article the other day. If you don't respond to a lead within five minutes, it's going to somebody else. That's right. Which, you know, if I'm working someone's wedding on a Saturday night and you're home emailing me, there's a good chance I'm not getting back to you until Monday. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Uh, I'm guilty that of that as a shopper. If yeah. I'm looking for something, I'll call like the first three, the person that picks up the phone or the person that calls me right back and engages in a conversation. If I feel good, they're getting my business. Right. If I'm looking for a contractor for the house, you know, little things. The first plumber to call me back is the one that's fixing the sink. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. No, and, and I'm guilty of it as well. It's just, it's, the, it's the, the, the world we live in today has changed, obviously. Sure. Unfortunately, when it comes to your wedding, if you're spending a good amount of money, which I think most people are, um, you really should be well informed as to who's playing your music. You know, I know I said it, it's going to sound cliche, but if the DJ is not good, the rest of the party is not good. There goes that big waste of money. Yeah. So, you know, I, I would highly recommend interviewing your DJ, getting to know them, asking as many questions as possible, you know, feeling comfortable, even just with their personality, getting a rapport with them and, and being excited about it. You know, the one thing any DJ can really relay is that they're excited to work for you, you know, over, over being in business, over being a salesperson. I was a DJ, you know, <laughs> I came here cause I enjoyed I entertaining people and I loved music. And, and the interaction and connection to the dance floor is the most important thing for me. It's really entertaining the guests in front of me, making sure they had the time of their life for four hours at their wedding. That interactive feel is why I'm here. It's not to sell you on this. It's not to run a business. It was to DJ the music I like to hear and make you guys dance. You've really won me over on on the trust factor. Like I would feel really good after sitting down face to face and talking about the the entire night because I'm I'm so informed now as to how important the DJ is. It's not somebody just playing music. And it, it is such a different feeling because I've had dinner parties where I have music on in the background and it's music in the background. It's not somebody really looking out for you and making sure hosting your event for you. It's, it takes a big load off of the couple's shoulders to know that they're in good hands. Um, but I know that there's a lot of nervous Nellies out there. You know, what do you do if, do you ever have a bride or a groom want to show up at a party that you're DJing at a, at a wedding and, you know, peek in? <laughs> How do you handle that? I, I'll be honest. I get the question like, Maybe once every couple of years. Like okay. it's really not a frequent topic. Oh, it's not. Okay. Um, you know, based on meeting with me, you know, if they're actually meeting with me, you know, or they're meeting with one, you know, a member of my team. Um, just like you said, they feel trust. They feel the trust in us. They they gauge that trust right there at the meeting in our office. And, you know, they can get a little highlight reel of, you know, somebody else's wedding to show that we show up in a suit and we look appropriate and we host professionally. And you know, if it's a beach wedding, are you in like khakis and a linen shirt it's gonna with be a guitar based, strap across? Definitely no guitar <laughs> strap. Um, we're DJs because we don't play instruments. Um, so no, if it's a beach wedding, we're going to ask you that question. How do you want it? You know, what's the attire for the day? Is it, you know, is it semi-casual? Is it, you know, formal? What's what's going on? Oh, that's thoughtful. Um, but typically we're in a suit, you know, regardless. Do you have any videos that you can share with, with any of your clients yeah. so that they could see, have some insight as to like... Oh, that's what intelligent lighting does. That's yeah, most what... de- most definitely. Everything's visual. So when we have that consultation, I want to show you everything. I want to show you vi- pictures, still pictures, not just video. I want to show you still pictures of what the setup looks like so you can understand where the elements are in the room. I want to show you a video of how those elements affect the room. So, you know, having having uh, video content as well as, you know, some images of things that you've done in the past is, is really good, you know, and helpful to show people. Hard examples. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Jamie, define a DJ. Everybody has, you know, we hear these different uh, definitions of what a DJ is, but what, what it just describe it. What is a DJ? All right, so the DJ is the person that's actually playing the music. Um, what, are, what is their job? What do they do? They're, they're not just there to play the music that we talked about reading the crowd a little bit. So they have to look at their audience, kind of feel their audience, and play what they think the next song is going gonna, is gonna to keep them on the dance floor. So they're experienced at weddings, they're experienced DJing weddings. They can sense the crowd, the ages of the crowd, and what they're going to move to. Um, technically, they're blending the music, so it's seamless. Um, keep, keeping people there, you know, is important. So seamless mixing um, keeps the people on the dance floor. If there's a pause in between, if there's a break in between, people start to walk away. If the song volume at the end starts to gradually fade out, people start walking away. So it has to be done professionally. There's there's technical, you know, technical uh, skill behind it. Um, you know, today you can get education on that, you know, growing up, you know, cause I'm the older veteran, you know, I had to learn that on my own. <laughs> there was no school, you know, decades ago to, uh, 
to learn how to DJ. You had to you had to pick it up. But there is there is a passion and love for it. So the DJ has to have a passion. Now and you love would be music. the professor of DJ. I would be the professor. Yes. <laughs> yes. Jamie, I, I really want to thank you so much for joining us. This conversation has been incredibly insightful uh, for, for myself, for Natasha, for all of the, 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 the people that are listening out there. Choosing a DJ is, is um, it's, it's definitely not an easy thing to do. I mean, there's so many DJs out there, but now having spoken to you and understanding all the components that go into choosing a good DJ, uh, it's, a, it's a lot more than just, you know, a playlist music. That's right. I'm taking much more from this conversation. It goes way beyond what you're listening to. Very technical. Just, it's really, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming on. No, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. If there's any other questions, I'm always happy to to give an answer. If you've been listening to this episode of podcast and and maybe you're on your desktop and you want to listen on your phone, um, we're on all the major sites out there, Amazon and Spotify and Audible, iTunes, um, you know, there's a bunch of them. So feel free to look us up. Please make sure to follow us guys on Facebook and Instagram at Live Picture Studios. Any questions you have, email us, podcast at livepicturestudios.com. You can find all of our links there. Or hashtag LPS Podcast if anybody has any questions or anything that you'd like to share. If you want to be a guest, that would be super cool. This podcast has been produced at K-Vibe Studios, specifically by Kuali, Natalia Delgado, Mark Falcon, our wonderful editor, Nicole Palmetti. Music has been provided by Ian Post and Artlist. Until next time. Bye. Bye, guys. Happy planning. Woo!